it's been described as various things, sustainability, luxury, but not everyone here is an expert on sustainability in the way that say Sonu is. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about luxury, modern luxury, what it means, and what we've lost sight of in our quest for luxury, which I think covers a fairly wide ground and should get, get, give us enough to talk about. I'm going to start obviously with Sonu, because I mean most of us, I mean she announces also, know the broad outlines of the story you're born into a wealthy NRI family, you could have joined the family business, you break away, you decide you're gonna go into hotels which your family had never done before, you come to the Maldives, which at that stage was a really down market destination, yeah. you invent luxury tourism in the Maldives, you raise it to the level where it's what, now the world's most expensive resort destination? Most probably, yeah. Probably, yes. yes, yes. No, the, the yeah. Maldives, More yeah. than Bora Bora or anywhere. Well, when, you, when you think about the consolidation of luxury brands that are here, yeah. so um, Six Senses, which was a brand I set up, um, they're struggling to be in the top 20 in terms of rev par, average yeah. rate multiplied by occupancy. There's a Four Seasons as well, which is just trying to get into the top 20, yeah. such as the, the, you know, the, the depth of um, luxury experiences. And it's great. We feed off each other. We're, I think um, you know, we're a little bit the Silicon Valley of um, luxury travel and tourism here in the Maldives. And um, the more luxury resorts you have, the better, because it keeps us all on our toes and um, it makes the destination more attractive um, generally. So I'm, I'm actually uh, a big proponent of other luxury resorts coming into a destination. Initially, you know, when we started, I was a bit worried when um, uh, Bunyan Tree opened a year or two later and then you had the Four Seasons Kudahura. I was a bit worried because suddenly the luxury inventory was doubling, yep. you know, Banyan Tree was the same size, Kudahura was double the size of, um, you know, each of us, and, um, but it, it actually induced more demand. Okay, so, the, so step one yeah. was you turned the Maldives into a luxury destination. Step mm. two was you built a very different kind of hotel. It mm. was not like the average luxury resort hotels. Mm. We'd had luxury resort hotels before in Bora Bora, perhaps in, the, in Hawaii and in places, but there was nothing quite like so never Fushi, in fact, there still isn't. Mm. So tell us how you thought of that, that yeah. definition of luxury. Sure. Um, I think um, what um, generally um, defines luxury brands is founders with a vision. So I'm sure your great-grandfather, when he, when he set up Cartier, he was obviously a passionate jeweler, passionate about making jewelry. And, um, and so Ava and I, um, really wanted to develop something here and it was our vision of what a luxury resort would be based on our travels. Um, we we like the fact that we're on holiday to be barefoot. I spend quite a lot of holidays on a boat and that's the nice thing about a boat, you know, you're not even loud with shoes on a boat, you know, the, the crew sort of scream if you've got shoes on. So, so that was really um, the style we wanted. Um, sustainability was obviously very important to us. Uh, growing up, in, uh, you know, studying at Oxford in the late 80s you start to see the impact yeah. of the environment. Um, James uh, Lovelock was talking about uh, the Gaia theory and um, uh, around that time, right. and you had the first noises about global warming and the consequences. And then you arrive at this beautiful destination, and you realize that that's why people are, like us, you know, we're traveling ha halfway around the world, and we were actually the first foreign uh, developer here. So up to then, all the resorts were developed by Maldivians because if you're a Maldivian, the government auctioned off islands, and if you're a Maldivian, you got 10 out of um, 100 points. Mm. So we couldn't actually, foreigners f couldn't actually win a bid um, where there was locals involved. And, and for locals, it was a license to print money. So they, they were farmers farming coconuts, and then um, the tourism started with the, the Germans. So the Germans were very successful in Sri Lanka, and um, they wanted an extension to the culture. So they, um, they thought, well, what about a nice hop? So they, they, they chartered this sort of turboprop and started sending tourists here. And they would go to farmers uh, who, who were near the airport and would say, you build some huts for us. We'll send our guests. And it's a 10-year contract. It's called a bed contract. We guarantee 80% uh, occupancy. And here's three years in advance. So they had the cash to build the resort. Sometimes the local bank, it was mainly State Bank of India at the time, uh, they would sort of give a little bit of an overdraft facility to just get the hotel opened. And um, suddenly these farmers were becoming millionaires. And the government was saying, at the time, the government didn't realize the potential of tourism. So they said, well, provided you pay us the, you know, the annual 
farmer's uh, rental, which was like $1,000 a year or something, that was a calculation based on the coconuts the farmer was uh, cutting, you can, you can do tourism. And suddenly, instead of making you know, $10,000 a year and paying the government 1000 they were making a million dollars or so at that time and paying the government 1000 And then everyone realized it was a good thing, so everyone in the Maldives wanted to be in tourism. So I think because we were foreign, and we realized, you know, er, the Maldivians had grown up with this, so they didn't like the trees. The trees caused mosquitoes. So the first thing a Maldivian developer would do would erase um, all the vegetation. Like if you went to Kurumba in the old days, it's all landscaped. It's all sort of um, it's sort of bad Bell Collins type design with these horrible plants from different parts of the world. And we we just loved the destination, so we were trying to preserve it. And, and that was because we were foreign. We had a different perspective. I'll come back to you and talk about sustainability. I want to talk to you about a question that Sonu asked you yesterday, actually, which we never really had the full answer to, which was, how did your fa grandfather feel when he sold what was a great brand that the family had created? And even before that, how did he feel when his cousins, it was who ran the operations in New York and in uh, Paris, they also sold out before he did, right? So what is it like building up a family business? And he was what? third generation, fourth generation, fourth generation, that you've built up with these values and suddenly you have no control over it any longer. What was that like? Do you remember what he said? Um, can you, is this on? Yes. Um, so I wasn't born when he sold, um, but from what I hear um, yeah, from my mother, he, it was very, very hard for him. I think it's hard when you... He had a great sense of duty like his father had. Um, his father actually had wanted to become a Catholic priest and his father was the youngest of the three Cartier brothers who, who took over from their father in the early 20th century. And when his father, Jack, had been younger, um, he said to his brothers, I, you know, I want to be his priest. And his brothers had said, well, no, your duty is to the fraternal trinity, our fraternal trinity, not, not the holy trinity. Um, you know, so he, he remained very religious throughout his life, but his, he really felt, felt his duty was to the firm and he passed that down to his son, my grandfather. And he also passed down these, these values that I talk a bit about in my book, the idea of be very kind, treat everyone with respect, always be the best that you can be. An expression in Cartier London is um, the best is, um, only the best is good enough, really. And, um, and the idea of never copy, only create. They were always creating new, different things. Every piece, well, almost every piece was totally unique and handmade. And so it was very hard for him to sell and to pass that on. But as you say, there were three branches, London, Paris, New York. His two cousins were holding New York and Paris. They'd both sold for different reasons. I think that often happens with the fourth generation. For example, his cousin in New York had grown up you know, relatively wealthy, hadn't had the same relationship with his father, had, had, didn't have the same attachment to the business at all that my grandfather did. So, you know, would rather the money, quite frankly, than run the business. Uh, the, his other cousin in Paris wasn't that interested in the business either, so she sold. So Grandpa was left holding the only Cartier branch. And I think, it, yeah, it really saddened him to sell, but it was, he felt that it was unsustainable to keep going. Um, and, you know, holding all of the three branches, as I mentioned yesterday, were still called Cartier. They were still creating pieces that looked similar with, you know, like, for example, a tank watch. All the tank watches from each branch would have Carte on the dial. It would be the same design. But one, like in London, would all be made by hand. Everything in that watch would be made by hand. The, the gold case, the, um, the dial, the hands, you know, versus machine made in, in some of the other places when it, was, when it was sold. So I think he felt he didn't really have a lot of choice. And I think at that time, in the 60s and 70s, people didn't value that handmade luxury you know, it was going through, a, uh, people wanted more mass market affordable luxury. And I think it, it, now it's come full circle, of course, and the pieces he was making at that time, like the crash watch, is, you know, reached a record of 1.65 million or something when this, one of my grandfather's watches was sold last week at auction. So I think <laughs> it's funny, things come full circle, but at the time it was very hard to, to make ends meet. You said yesterday that for years afterwards, he wouldn't really talk about the sale or talk about it, which suggests it affected him quite deeply. I think so, yeah, because I think to, to have that burden of being the one to have broken the family line, even though his cousins had done it first, it was a great sadness. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely was. It seems he was passionate about what he was doing as well, and when you're passionate about what you're doing and then you wake up the next morning, you can't do that anymore, 
that's also yeah. um, and then you see other people running your business and totally, doing things that you would um, frown on you know uh, uh, say, you wouldn't know, have done the like, same thing but I think yeah. that's partly why he sold it because he saw the world was changing and actually the pieces he, he it was in his DNA to make mm. pieces like as you say he was passionate about he was such a perfectionist it would have been a nightmare to work for him like he, on a box when it shut he had to listen to it and always had to make exactly the right click or the same with a watch, the strap, it had to make, and if it was the click wasn't loud enough or wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, the perfect sound, he would send it back and it was redone. And when a brooch was made, he would, there'd be a model who would wear it in the office and go in a circle. If it didn't catch the light in exactly the right way under all angles, you know, it'd be sent back and reset. Apprentices would train for seven years before they were allowed to kind of touch a piece. So that the work that went to each place was so phenomenal. And he knew that the world was changing. And in order to make money, he probably had to change. And he couldn't make pieces in that way anymore. And he, he just said, I couldn't do that. He couldn't bring himself to. Right. How long did he live that. after he sold Cartier? Um, a long time. He lived, I mean, I was in my 30s when he died. So, so yes. what did he do in the years that followed? He moved to the south of France. He um, built a. He, he turned, he's very, very creative, so, and he loved design, and so he turned his you know, artistic eye to the garden, created this kind of magical paradise in his house in the south of France. He made an artist studio in the garden, and he would draw, and, um, but he didn't work. But he remained creative. Throughout. Very creative, yeah, yeah that, was, that was him, yeah. Okay. I want to take you back to something you said yesterday. You said that in the Baroda Registry of Jewels, there are many pieces that are now clearly Cartier, now that you've identified them. But they were valued not because they had the Cartier brand, but because they were exquisite works. So do you think, in a sense, we've lost that tradition of valuing things because of the artisanship, because of the quality, and we've become a bit brand, brand conscious now? Absolutely, I think. Uh, because if you look at the Indian culture of artisanal and bespoke and custom made, everything was such. Yeah. Everything was made to order. Everything was, you know, exclusive. There was, it was all eco-friendly and sustainable because craft, uh, you know, derived from nature. Um, and that is how it was. And whether it was uh, celebrating Cartier or whatever, the patronage came because they were pieces of exceptional quality. It really wasn't a brand. And they became a brand because of the patronage they received. It was not the other way around. It was not the patronage was received because they were a brand. Right. They became the brand because there was this sustained patronage uh, through all these important people for so many generations. And we've kind of lost that. And I think we, we kind of uh, fall back on a brand because we feel it ensures quality and, and, and you know, style and design. And, but also, I think it speaks money and wealth, which is uh, and taste, which I don't think always brands yeah. do. So I think the Baroda family has actually been good on jewelry, if you'll pardon the expression. There was, you referred yesterday to the estranged wife of Fateh Singh Rao Gaikwad, who went to live in Juhu, who had a fair amount of jewelry. There was the lady who went to the south of France, who I think startled everyone with the jewelry she had. And you referred to Gayatri Devi's mother, who most people don't realize was a Baroda princess, who had things like jewels on a tortoise and stuff like that. So how, what did that feel to be born into that tradition where jewelry was on everything, including your tortoise? Yes, I think, uh, and it's a very Indian tradition, Veer, if yeah. I tell you, in India, things are decorative, whether it's a little rangoli or a trellis on the floor or, you know, how you, you put a, a, a toran or, you know, a, it, decoration, Indian you know, culture is decorative. And the more you could afford, the more you would uh, you know, make things around you prettier and decorative. But uh, the, 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 the tortoise was like a talisman, apparently. She would yeah. carry it with her because it would bring her luck, so obviously. She'd take it, apparently, to the gaming tables. And yes. while people were trying to bid, they would be distracted by the, the jewel yes. tortoise coming <laughs> up to them. I must use that now. Thank yeah. you. Right. <laughs> it's good. It's a, it's yeah. a good trick. So yeah. no, you've sort of so, so you've I mean, so, sorry, you op you yeah. op you've opened the door on this one, so I have to ask. Yeah, you yeah, sure. I sort of promised I wouldn't ask her about Cartier and and the way it is now because she's got nothing to do with the Cartier. Right. Yeah. However, I mean there is yeah. a parallel. You did sell six senses, and yeah. you are seeing a company that you built and you yeah. created. Yeah, so no, sure. a, what did it feel like after selling, and yeah. b, how do you feel now when you see six senses? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, before I touch on that. Yeah. Um, 
I just wanted to sort of build on what um, Francesca was saying, and um, and the seventies was an odd era because you didn't have much wealth at the time. You had huge inflation, yeah. high taxation, labor governments that were really um, penalizing successful people. Yeah. So you didn't have the success you had today. And so, in a way, people were doubling down and they were buying cheaper things. And uh, you know, Bernard Arnault has been very successful at taking brands where the founders would never dream of um, compromising their brand and then milking them. You know, if you think about Dom Perignon, um, they make five million bottles of it. It's, it's crazy. You know, they, they charge a couple of hundred dollars. And um, you'd think, OK, it's very rare. You know, there's only like Cristal, you know, a couple of hundred thousand. But it's, it's five million. It's, it's a huge cash machine he's done that because he's emotionally divorced. And I think that's been his, his huge success, to be a cold financier who sees the opportunity in the, the luxury space and takes advantage of these family businesses who, at some point, lose their way slightly or, or lose their passion. Um, in one way or another, or have family disputes like um, Gucci. You know, he tried to buy it and get it, but um, the Bulgari family are uh, guests here, and you know they they weren't quite the same. You know, I think uh, there was Paolo and Nicola, and there was one other brother who I think uh, or cousin who initiated the sale. And so uh, the two brothers, when they were here, you could see that they weren't too happy about it, because it'd been their life. And when you talk to them about jewelry, and they talked about Sri Lanka and the beauty there. And so um, I, I think. Um, Things fortunately have changed, and you've got a turnaround. So um, you were just explaining that it's not quite the same, but I think it is. You've got this renaissance because there's been a huge surge in ultra high net worth individuals, yeah. and I think um, wealthy people. It's it's been growing at time of the year. That ultra high net worth individual sector has been growing by compounded at twenty percent a year for the last ten years, and um, people are getting fed up of um, institutionalized luxury. They want the individuality, and so you do have new brands coming with new people who are passionate about making a jewel or a watch or um, a dress or whatever. And they're, 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 they're creating individual things and, and ultra high net worth individuals are willing to pay a bit more for that. But coming on to the thing Sorry, about but, six but On the other hand, the Louis Vuitton, yeah. Speedy or whatever will still sell all over the world in massive quantities and people will think it's a luxury. It's, it's, been a, it's, it's a big machine, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, but even there with LV, LV is one of those more successful brands. Some of the yeah. other brands aren't so successful yeah. because he's diluted the brand value, whereas his CEO at LV has still maintained some craftsmanship. Their marketing's all about the individuality and the craftsmanship, and they're really trying to drive that angle, and they've been quite successful there. I mean, he obviously has his eyes on the Hermes, but the Hermes family, I don't well, think, would, you know. Well, understandably, <laughs> right, given what he'd probably do to the brand. Yes, exactly, yes. And, uh, but they've been really successful, and they, they've managed to stay independent. Yeah because they focused on the quality. And so, so that, you know, the quality focus is, is rewarded and um, the focus. So yeah, it's, it's been bittersweet with Six Senses. So um, I had to uh, make the sale um, because it really wasn't the way we, we were going. Hmm. Um, you know, we were all about, um, and, and I, my job description was changing. So when we started with Suneva, a lot of my time was spent creating things, you know, creating the design of a villa, or creating a concept that could be a food and beverage concept or a HE host engagement policy, you know, how, to, how one drives engagement. And um, that was where I spent a lot of my time. But then when you're the CEO of a management company, all you do is spend your time going to hotel conferences, meeting investors, and then you go and have big budget meetings with them. And you're trying to just make sure that the next property is not as bad as the last. And that's a terrible thing. You want the next property to be so much better. And, um, and that's all you could really satisfy yourselves with. And um, so Six Senses, it's, it's just really bizarre that they've um, survived with their strategy for so long because when we sold, we still had this focus on trying to get unique, create unique resorts. And then they were just trying to sign contracts. It was a PE firm who incentivized the CEO, and he was incentivized by the number of management contracts he signed. The head of development, you know, same thing, you know, signed contracts. But they were just signed for the sake of signing, and so they have some properties which fundamentally don't work in those destinations, so they're not making money. The owner's really upset, so of course it becomes a very tense relationship. And importantly, they don't get fees. So the return on energies is, is terrible. And there are a lot of the new contracts they're signed where the fees are so low and their overheads have to grow to service them that they're actually, it's, it's compound their losses. So we sold at a 5 million EBITDA was positive, and, they, and that was you know 15, 15 minus the three Sunevas, and we had two other assets which we sold 
free of the management. So they, they, they had 10 uh, when they bought the business. And I think now they've got about it's 20, 25 in operation with a lot in the pipeline. And they're lost, they've gone from positive to loss, and um, the losses are compounding. But they're also just an IHG brand, right? Run by the same company that yeah. runs Holiday and Express, yeah. and a company that has no great record of luxury. That is the challenge for these um, luxury brands in our industry: is they risk becoming the Intercontinentals and Hiltons of yeah. the 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 twenty thirty. So if you think about it, one trip when he, he was he was the CEO of a Pan Am, but a <laughs> funny name for a CEO of an airline company, um, and um, he he uh, set up Intercontinental, and the idea was. You had these oases, um, and that's where the celebrities and the heads of states yeah. would stay, or, or you know, like the um, the L.A. Hilton. Conrad Hilton was a luxury hotel, and then they left, and they started, you know, these groups started managing other people's hotels, and the owners were big asset firms, sovereign wealth companies, or uh, listed private equity firms, or you know, of uh, property real estate companies, and they had many brands, but the same asset managers and the same architects and designers. And over time, you know, the difference between one and the other just became the name on the door. And that was the challenge when Bass, Bass bought, you know, they sold um, the breweries and they, they bought Intercontinental. They did an audit and um, they said, well, what's the differentiation between a Hilton and a Sheraton and a Marriott and an Intercontinental? And after sort of a lot of money in six months, they said nothing, just the name <laughs> on the door. And, and that's the risk with your, you know, your next tier, the, you know, St. Regis and Ritz-Carlton are now both part of Marriott. Yeah. So even they don't, I asked them, you know, the head of their luxury division, they don't know what the difference is quite, you know. And it's just, okay, we're in a city and we've got an exclusivity with one owner on Ritz-Carlton, so we can't do another Ritz-Carlton there, and there's another developer who wants to do a luxury hotel, so we give them some Regis. You know, so it's a bit like General Motors, you know, they, yeah. those brands lost their track, didn't they? I remember they before he died, some years before he died, I interviewed Arnie Sorensen, who was then oh, yeah. head of Marriott, and I said, what does Sheraton, which you now own, stand for? And he said, I have no idea. If you find out, let me know. <laughs> yeah. So I think there is that danger. Yeah? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about artisans, because you work with artisans. The sense of luxury, the sort of stuff she talked about in the heyday of Cartier, was about workmanship. And I suppose in a different sense, what Sulu's talking about is the same thing, that attention to detail, that high quality. Do you feel that in India we're losing out? Certainly the middle class now, the younger people, don't seem that interested in what our ancient traditions were and all going to malls to buy Louis Vuitton and Michael Kors. Absolutely. So the truth still remains that the second largest employer agency in India is the craft sector. After farming, uh, the high handicraft sector is the second largest employee uh, generation uh, in India. However, the quality um, and the consistency of the products that are coming out have depleted over the years because the patronage has died. Earlier, the patronage for all craft or music or the finest of food or jewelry was the, the king or the sovereign or then the, 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 the god. So the temples were the um, pro prolific buyers or supporters of craft, whether it was mu musicians or uh, cuisine um, or so on and so forth. But over the years, because it's become more fashionable to be able to buy your products from an AC market or a mall, um, nobody wants to go to a heart where you know, people are sitting on the floor and selling their wares. And if we meet them, then we, we haggle, we negotiate. We would never do that in a mall. We would buy whatever the price label is. But here we always question um, you know, why they are charging what they are. And many of these objects take months to make, and they are under apprenticeship till they are able to make those things, like we spoke about seven years of apprenticeship. And the same thing used to happen in India to make a quality craft. And now all of that has got merged into making a mumbo jumbo, which looks popular. So you'll see elephants in Rajasthan and typical paper mache in, in Kashmir. And, and it's all become a mix of, of craft and, and different techniques, which, which is sad because no one's really documented the whole genesis of these graphs and and the whole graph of what they were and how they are really coming down. So, um, and it's just getting worse because they are so uh, divorced. The craftsmen sitting in their rural areas, they don't know what the end consumer wants to buy or see. So they don't know what what you know. They are making dokra work in in Chhattisgarh. They don't know how it can be used in a tiny flat in Mumbai. And these things project these objects keep getting rejected. And the market is growing abroad. 
but the quality isn't really improving, it's only going down. It's a, there's a big disconnect between the craft sector, which is creating the craft sector, and the consumer. And there needs to be a bridge there. Yeah, and it's getting worse, isn't it? Because you go to any of these malls, and now the mid-market malls, they're just full of people buying factory-made, branded goods and pretending it's luxury. Well, it is sad. Coming, coming back to luxury, we I listened to your talk yesterday. You spoke a lot about craftsmanship. You spoke a lot about the beauty of what your grandfather and the artisans had done. We didn't speak that much about luxury itself. So what is luxury according to you? Well, I mean, my grandfather always said that, um, he said that his father had told him this as well. He said, yes, you know, a Cartier jewel will be expensive. Yeah. But if it's expensive because the gems are of the highest quality and the design is unique and classic and yet somehow modern at the same time, this was a real thing with the Cartiers, never copy, only create. They should never copy existing jewelry. They should take inspiration from everywhere except from existing jewelry. So when Louis Cartier um, started building up the kind of creative part of Cartier in the early 20th century, he didn't hire jewelry designers. He hired interior people who, who designed interior um, architects, people who worked in lace, people who worked in ceramics. Um, his best designer, he found up a ladder installing a balcony on, um, I think it was Rue Rivoli. He was walking along, he saw this beautiful balcony being installed and he called up to the guy at the top and said, who designed that? And this guy was like, well, I did, I'm, but I'm busy. I'm, and he was like, can you come down? Louis, I think, was quite <laughs> arrogant and expected people to come down and speak to him. And eventually this, this guy came down and said, just what do you want? And Louis Cartier handed him his business card and said, will you come in for an interview? I want you to, to be a designer at Cartier. And this guy, Charles Jaco, said, well, what are you talking about? I don't design jewelry. And Louis said, you know, come in. And sure enough, when he'd finished his contract with the, with the railings, he came in and he turned out to be Cartier's best designer. And him and Louis would go on to create this, some incredible pieces. But sorry, the idea of that is that they were creating, you know, he was thinking outside the box. So that was part of it, creating new pieces, um, new designs, but always with the best possible materials. So I talked a bit yesterday about my great grandfather traveling to India to meet the Maharajas, but also to buy the gems. He didn't wait for the gems to come to him in London or his brother in Paris, a gem dealer turning up at Cartier showing them. He, wanted, he went to the sapphire mines in Sri Lanka. He didn't just go to the gem dealers in Sri Lanka. He asked to go to the sapphire mines. You know, He wanted to see where they were being mined. He wanted to check that the men were working in safe conditions. He did the same in the Persian Gulf. He didn't just go to the Persian Gulf. He asked to go on a fishing boat. I think the pearl sheiks were quite surprised because that was something for the pearl divers. But he wanted to see exactly where everything came from. And then when he went back, of course, he was able to to use that in his promoting the firm. He said, you know, we are suppliers of pearls, we know where these come from. So that was part of it, really understanding the product and getting the best possible raw materials. Um, and the same with, with the mounts. They didn't just use um, gold and silver. Cartier, one of the first to use platinum. And um, this was, Louis apparently got the idea for using platinum. This was way before it was a precious metal. He saw a bright, um, metal underneath a train carriage and he thought wow you know that's bright and thin and strong let's try making diamond jewelry with that so and it was hard to buy platinum in small small quantities then it came from the Urals in Russia but people were buying it for big industrial projects and he only wanted a small amount and he you know he got the platinum got his workshop to play with it to mix it with other metals until he found the perfect alloy that was light and bright and enabled him to create jewels totally unlike the competition, because unlike silver, it didn't oxidize, it didn't go black, it stayed bright and shiny. And it was stronger and more flexible than, than, than gold and silver. So you could have a very tiny mount, which meant that the diamond or the gem really you know, was shown to its best advantage. So all, I mean, it was, it's hard to kind of define luxury because every single part of the process was just the best that you can possibly do. And it was never, resting on their laurels, you know? He always wanted something new. He said in one letter, we need something new, something tastier, something new, you know, that was last season. And, and you see that now, and the, and the quantity of their output in that period, in the early 20th century, just people come up at auction the whole time, and they are valued highly, and I, I think they should be, because when you understand the work, it, it went into them. But there are so many varied pieces all the time, but each one was unique, each one was handmade. Um, and it's that 
exclusivity, I think. So yeah, my grandfather said, sorry, back to what I started saying, was my grandfather said, if a piece is, is expensive, but it's worth it, people will forget what they paid. If they can pass it down to their daughter or, and then they pass it down to the next generation and so on, it, it's worth it, it's something they treasure and they will keep coming back to you. Um, and I think that's, that's what happened. So it's not so difficult, judging by what we've heard, to get a fix on what luxury is in terms of a good. It's artisanship, yeah. beauty, a degree of exclusivity, etc. It's much more difficult when it comes to a service, isn't it? How do you define the luxury in the hotel industry, true luxury? Yeah, so um, it's, um, luxury is a word, as I say, has been you know, misused. and um, It's been, it's banal the way we yeah, use yeah, the word luxury. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, Essentially, uh, it, it's a philosophy, it's that which is rare. Um, and when it comes to an experience, it's something that's new to you and true, you know, when you, you touch it and feel it, you know, it rings a chord in your heart, as, as I was explaining on Friday evening. And, um, and so that's essentially what, 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 what luxury is. And so um, you then have to think about, well, what is the context of our guests? Um, because what we are finding is that um, over the last 30, 40 years, you've had a huge demographic shift where the successful in the past with the landed gentry living in the castles, the palaces. Um, if you looked at the Sunday Times rich list, it was, you know, it was the Dukes and, you know, uh, the uh, what, um, Duke of Grosvenor and, you know, Duke of Westminster and so on um, were, were, were dominating the list and the Queen was on the top of the list. Um, and, and nowadays you look at the Sunday Times rich list, it's all people who are self-made, um, you know, at least 80% of it, uh, and they're, they're urban, they're living in And usually cities. not British as well. <laughs> in, in England at least, yes. yes. And, um, and so um, they, they, they're living a different context. So the traditional language of luxury was different because you know, if you were in the countryside and you had mud under your feet on a daily basis, and you had fresh air and fresh food or from your big estates and uh, a lot of space uh, and privacy, for you the change was going into the Cafe Royale and dressing up, four-piece uh, band playing and crystal champagne and lots of chandeliers and gilt and gold. But that was a change from your daily life outside in the countryside. And, um, but this is what our, our guests are seeing every day, you know, the marble and the gold. And so for them, what's rare is that um, fresh salad from the garden or just being able to bar walk barefoot, uh, as, as I explained. And, um, and um, I think also um, the other thing one needs to consider is that um, the key thing is magical service. And that's where the sustainability comes in, in that um, if you have a purpose, because today, um, you know, motivation. Daniel Pink's written this lovely book called Drive, and there's a TED talk which I highly recommend uh, people watching. It's about 15 minutes, and um, he's discovered a new form of motivation. And his point is, in the 21st century, um, you know, in, uh, historically you had uh, the prime source of motivation was um, uh, the caveman, you know, eat or be eaten, and then you know, motivation 2.0 was carrots and sticks, incentives, and sticks, punishment. And um, he points out that today, in the 21st century, there have been many tests. If you want someone to do something, a heuristic task, which is, you know, in, involves collaboration amongst people, incentives actually undermine performance. And he talks about the candle trick. You might have heard of that. You've, um, you're, you're given a table, a box of uh, tags, and there's a candle. Um, and so you've got to tr stick the candle onto the wall. And these groups of people, they, they work together and some of them say, okay, well, let's light the candle and let's, let's wax it against the wall. And um, the, the reality is you, you have to realize that the box, because it's got tax in it, is not the container for um, the tax, but it also can be a stand for the candle. So, you know, you, you tack the box onto the wall and then you put the candle there. Now, that's a, a heuristic task, which in developed economies, um, majority of people... Are, are, are doing, you know, most of their tasks are heuristic. It's not a sort of labor like, you know, paint a wall or, or move some bags across. And he says for those tasks, and, and the point is they did um, tests, you know, psychologists um, did tests, and they found that when someone was given an incentive, the performance was undermined. So that the teams that had a bonus, they were all clashing, they were after the incentive. Those that didn't have an, an incentive, it was just the pride of succeeding they would always beat um, those without. And um, so he says, you know, motivation 3.0 is autonomy, um, mastery, you know, the ability to firstly to d 
determine your destiny, you know, within your, and that's one of our challenges, you know, how do you create autonomy within jobs, even in the hospitality industry, you give your hosts some autonomy in what they're doing, even though they've got to turn up and serve something at a certain time, but you can still do that and give them um, in, independence on how they sort of organize themselves. And of course, there are other jobs where you, people do, you know, they, they can work from home, wherever they want. And then the other is mastery, this, um, this feeling that you're, 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 you're developing a skill or learning a skill. That's a, a big drive. And then finally, it's purpose. People want a sense of purpose in their lives, and that's what really drives them. And you find um, he calls them type X and type I. So those who are uh, rewarded by um, you know, the motivation 2.0, um, your typical bankers, uh, et cetera, um, they, they, they lead miserable lives because they don't have that sense of purpose. They're just there for the money. Um, it, it also uh, generates more crime. So they noticed that you know, when you do have incentives, it actually leads to crime. Whereas if you have um, a sense of purpose, um, your, your, your performance over time is, is, is very strong. And so if you can create that sense of purpose, you know, you have a core purpose around slow life, around sustainability, and we can be authentic to that, and people see that we really mean it, then our hosts are passionate about the fact that the first L in slow life is local. So they're generally hired locally, and then we're engaging locally, and we're generally doing well and good. And, um, and, and, and if you can align the purpose of the host with the purpose of the company, then you have hugely, hugely energized people, and that's what creates magical service. And fundamentally, in our industry, it's not how big the villas are or the quality of the food or the spa treatments, whatever. It's, it's, it's the magical service that the host that occupy the property creates. So in a way, the more sustainable you, you are, the more you focus on this idea of purpose, the more energized and engaged your hosts are. And, um, and you, you start to, so we've you know, won the equivalent of the Oscars for um, sustainability in travel and tourism more than once. You know, the World Travel and Tourism Council met in Dubai in 2008 and then 2015 in Madrid and gave us their Tourism for Tomorrow Award, but also the Reason of Condé Nast Traveler UK voted us best of the best in 2000, 2008, and even in 2013 or 14, we were number two. And that's of all categories, you know, city and so on. So sustainability and luxury go hand in hand when you think of it in that context in terms of, you know, what is a guest, what, what, what is a luxury? And then, you know, what, what, is, what is the definition of quality in our industry? You travel a reasonable amount. So when you, I mean, we've talked about luxury, as I said, in the context of, say, jewelry or clothes or whatever. But when you go to a hotel, what, according to you, is the kind of luxury you look for? I think um, quite true. I would like privacy and, uh, you know, I think that's important for us as a family where we have our privacy, where there's a lot of, uh, you know, we get that space and uh, to ourselves. I think that becomes one of the key uh, to be the um, how beautifully nature is really interwoven in the experience because we do like to travel for in places where there's nature. And I think that is it and just, of course, quality of food and all of that basic hygiene and comfort. But I think it's really about not being in the room, but really being able to experience everything outside. Outside the room. Yes. It's interesting. Yes. Same question. When you travel and you look for luxury, what do you look for? Um, good question. Well, this is pretty, this kind of tops. Yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> tops I'm, yeah. Like yeah I'm, I'm taking you away from jewelry. So you know. <laughs> I know, but I mean, here, this is incredible. Um, um, I, yes, when I travel with kids, I guess pretty much the same thing. Um, I've also traveled, I mean, I, it's, it's kind of comes down to the feeling genuine as well, doesn't it? And, um, and I think I've also done a lot of travel where I've been, for my research, traveling around, meeting descendants of the people connected to my family in some way, or you know, going to the same sapphire mines that my great-grandfather went to, or tracking down addresses on envelopes. And then I think it becomes yeah, less about where I'm sleeping that night, but uh, you know, the, the, the people I'm meeting and feeling part of the place I'm visiting. Um, that, that's become more important to me, I think. You know, feeling like you're speaking to those who are from there and, and hearing their stories, it adds a whole new dimension. Many years ago, when he still ran the Oriental Hotel, Kurt Wachtweetl said to me that the reason he was able to get such a premium for the Oriental compared to, say, the Shangri-La, which yeah. was next door, is because his mission was to treat luxury as a dream, that you came into 
a hotel, which and the Oriental, let's face it, it's basically a very ugly hotel yeah. that survives on the basis of a small author's lounge in the author's wing. But he said once you were inside, you had to feel it was a dream, that you were in a world where everything was perfect, the food was amazing, the service was warm. And he said that sounds easy to say, but it's actually the most difficult thing in the world to achieve. But you've achieved that, so tell us how you did it. No, thank you. I think it comes back to the people. So if you look at Kurt Backtitel, yeah. um, what he was famous for, firstly, he was there for a long time. Yes. And continuity is very important in the service industry. So uh, my favorite airline by far now is Qatar Airways yeah. because it's the airline um, where in the last 20 years you've had the same CEO. Uh, Southwest Airlines may be another one yeah. um, where there's that continuity. And if, it's, uh, if there's been a change in CEO, it's been someone who's been within the business for the last 30, 40 years. So I think the continuity is, is very important. And the other thing with the Oriental is um, a lot of their employees, they have a very low yes. host turnover, and a lot of their employees have been there for 30 or 40 years. Which and, they're really proud of. Yeah, and that's, that's the magic of the Oriental. As you say, it's, it's quite an ugly building, yeah. but it's, it's, you, know, you walk in and you've got yeah. these hosts who are really proud of being there and uh, have worked there for 40 years. And, and you have that continuity, so a guest comes back and they recognize. So we have hosts here like Suresh. You know, quite often um, a guest will come and um, last time they'll have a special diet, he'll remember that. Yeah. So he'll make that. Um, you know, Soba does that really well. There was a lovely story uh, of some guests um, with Soba, our chef, you know, who was at yeah. um, no, Out no of the way, Blue. Yeah. They sent, um, a, they gave a, sent um, Ava and I a letter. They wrote about it because they were so touched. So they hadn't been here for 10 years. And their last trip, it was r raining. <laughs> it's not always raining. <laughs> it's, but, that happens sometimes. Yeah. And so there was a rainy day activity um, where the GM and Chef Sobar and the chef at the time um, organized a cooking class. So mm -hmm. Sobar took a photo of it. And so they walk into Out of the Blue and he says, oh, welcome back. And you know, here's the photo. Do you remember 10 years ago? Oh, really? They were so touched, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they remember that really clearly. But uh, for Sobar to re re remember that, that event, so it's, you know, Jamil Abarman, you know, he'll, uh, the guest arrives, they, they're coming for their 15th or 16th time, they've been coming the last 20 years. Jamil will, you know, before um, they sit down and he just immediately sort of brings their drink. Uh, they don't have to ask anything. And so those are little touches. I think that's what, um, service is really very important in the hospitality scenes. And I think it's, it's this idea of, you know, low turnover, um, engaged hosts, as I talked about, the sense of purpose drives that. And um, we have a thing called the Virtuous Circle which I cribbed off Chip Conley, you know, uh, Joie de Vivre Hotels, you might have come across him. He was um, head of um, hospitality for Airbnb for a little while. He sold uh, um, Joie de Vivre at one point. It was the largest boutique brand in the South San Francisco Bay Area with about, actually largest hotel company with about 40 different hotels. And um, he, he had this idea of this virtual circle where you first create a concept and a philosophy that inspires and energizes your hosts, then your hosts are energized and inspired. They create amazing experiences for the guests, and then um, the guests come back year after year after year, and then you get the financial returns. So often people go the wrong way around. You know, they start looking at the numbers, and then they'll think a little bit about clients, and then, okay, let's think a bit about the employees. And that's the wrong way to, to drive a business for long-term sustained um, profitability. But there's also a sense here, and I've noticed this about all of your hotels, a sense in which the food is very important. Right. You take a lot of trouble over the food, yeah. about the ingredients. There yeah. are many more restaurant stroke outlets here than a, re a hotel of this size would normally have. Mm. You just have many more options than anybody else. And you also take a lot of effort at having well, the world's greatest chefs come here. The last time I was here, yeah. there was Julian Royer, who was three yes. best stars and number yeah. one chef in Asia. And you went to his restaurant in Singapore. You may or may not get a booking, but if you got one, you'd get what the kitchen did. But here was Julian in shorts, making the food himself, coming and serving everyone. That gives you a very special kind of experience, isn't it? Right, yes. You were at Heston Blumenthal for six months? He was, yes. yes. He, yes. yes. he yeah, I remember, yes. yes. He, didn't, he wouldn't cook and he wouldn't leave. <laughs> so. We drank a lot, yes. <laughs> yes. But, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, uh, the food is very important. And to sort of touch upon what Francesca said about uh, 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 Louis Cartier yeah. being inspired from other industries. What I find a real joy in, in um, our business is that if you look at hospitality with a very tight definition, so traditionally it's rooms, so the, the P&L that all hotels are run by, it's, it's called the American Hotel and Motel Association's Uniform System of Counts. There are about six or 7,000 members, the most are about 10,000 today. 
And um, that's what Marriott uses and all the big chains. So when you have an owner, uh, that's the P&L system. That's how things are accounted for. So when you talk about the gross operating profit, there's no misunderstanding, because, and it's updated from time to time. In the um, uniform system of accounts, you have three principal lines. So, and the principal one is rooms. Then you have food and beverage. And everything else is minor other departments. Because normally with a motel, it's a fax or something. So with us, it's life. So we change that in our p &L. It's called learning, inspiring, fun experiences. So, you know, um, Ali's there. He's running all the butlers. So they're all part of life. The, the spa therapists are creating light. The water sports team. Um, those who would organize the picnic if, we'd gone, if you'd gone on a picnic. So they're creating the life, the glassical team. And um, um, I, that diversity is very important and not being trapped and restricted. So traditionally, hoteliers would just focus on the rooms, yeah. not even the food, because they were in a motel, people wouldn't eat much, um, or they're in a city and people go out for dinner. And so for us, it's been um, a real joy to be able to create these experiences because our guests, are, it's remote, they can't go out. So you have to have great food. And it's not just about uh, French cuisine or Italian cuisine, etc. It's all about the depth of the different experiences, the plant-based. And, and then, you know, we've um, uh, developed you know, new, new crafts. So the greatest reduction in mosquitoes in the yeah. world is on this island. Yeah. You know, Bill Gates has spent a fortune uh, with the Wolbachia bacteria funding that, where essentially insects have um, a natural bacteria called Wolbachia. Mosquitoes don't, and it renders the male mosquito impotent if they get it. So they've been taking Wolbachia, putting into mosquitoes, releasing those out into areas. They've only had a 95% reduction and huge, huge investment. Whereas here, these simple traps um, has helped us. The, the idea of recycling, if you went to EcoCentro, you know, how do you make a pyrolysis oven and take the charcoal? And so all of that. And then on the food, plant-based. So you know, a couple of years ago, we realized we want to go plant-based. And um, we're now pushing boundaries on different cheeses and um, ice creams. You know, ice creams are um, they're, they're tasty, they're delicious, but they're without dairy and they're without sugar. Yeah. And that, again, was a little bit of a challenge for our team. And you know, how do you create that creaminess if, you, you know, if you're using almond milk or coconut milk? And um, th those discoveries are great for our team. But the fish, or, which is brined, so brining it for 24 hours, it becomes more succulent. These are little tricks which you know, we just love learning about and discovering. And, um, and that's what makes the, 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 the business The foie gras is cruelty free. The yes. caviar is sustainable. Yeah, yeah. All those details. And, um, yeah. and, and that's fun because it's, it's enjoyable for the people involved. Otherwise, if you're just you know, running a traditional hotel, and you're just making sure the rooms are fixed yeah. and restaurants are operating. Um, and, and reinventing things. So for example, you know, Maria comes from um, a restaurants in, in Bangkok. I'm sure that in her past job, they were allocating waiters to tables. Right. Because a guest would come in, and you want efficiency. So this waiter looks after those five tables, the next one there. Here, our guests are here for 10 days. They're very unbusy. And they're going to have breakfast every morning. And so we allocate the waiters. So if you're sitting here one day and then over there the other day, um, you have the same waiter. And you know, it's just rethinking those things. And that, that becomes um, enjoyable. And um, you know, how do you sort of redefine the way you go about a hotel? And it's a bit like um, your, your, your great grandfather looking at different materials. Because traditionally, jewelers are just saying, OK, well, let's focus on the jewel or the design. But you know, what about the material? And yeah. how can that help? It's also help? similar, I was thinking, to the, to the client service as well, that each salesman was allocated, you know, each client had a sp specific yeah. salesman, and yeah. they knew everything about their client. You know, they had yeah. cards about, they knew more yeah. about their client than the client's wife yeah. probably knew about them, especially when they had mistresses yeah. and so on. <laughs> they had to keep track of which jewel went to which woman. Um, but, you know, you know, they knew where they liked to holiday. They would, like, if there, if there was a client from, you know, a very important client who was getting on an ocean liner from New York to London, the, his salesman would find out about that, would get a tip, because the salesman knew all the all the, ho the hotel, people in the best hotels, knew the people on the, on the ocean liner company, they would get a tip from them saying, Mr. Ford, yeah. for example, is traveling from New York to London yeah. tomorrow. And the salesman would cancel all his plans and make sure he had a, he had a ticket for the same ocean liner, also yeah. in first class, because that, if you're on an ocean liner for several days crossing the ocean, it's the best possible yeah. <laughs> opportunity to sell exactly. to a client. Yeah. And they've got lots of opportunities for the wife to try on a different necklace each night over dinner and the... Yeah. And the in the um, restaurant. So it's exactly the, the same thing. You would drop everything for your client and know them right. inside out. Yeah. yeah. Laurie Graf used to do that. So he was, you'd originally see him in Stad, you know, Graf. The, ju the jeweler. Bef he, he, be for about 20 years, he had no shops. And you'd see him in Stad or in, in uh, St. Moritz. He'd be the palace there. 
be having tea with people, and um, that's how he sold his jewelry, and um, and eventually he started, you know, creating shops. Yeah. So would you come nice. back here? Yeah. Sure. yeah. No, I mean to the hotel, and what would you remember about it? I think what um, what would definitely bring me back is, of course, the service, like he said, and uh, the sustainability factor, and the food. I think the food is important. Yeah. Here, isn't yeah. It? yeah. Great, Sonu. Thank you, all of us. They keep making frantic gestures to me, asking me to wrap this up. <laughs> we could have spoken for another hour, but thank you very much. Great panel, great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.